Hello and welcome to another Kips Personal Training Application Podcast. My name is Tyler Valencia and I'm the president of Kips and Kettlebell Concepts. Today we're going to talk about wellness coaching. We have guest Mark Tehan. He's been a wellness professional in the corporate and private sector for 20 plus years. And over that time span, he's been developing wellness coaching education for any fitness professional. So what is wellness coaching? These are topics that we're going to dive into and how it applies to personal training, group exercise, or even just dealing with clients in general. So Mark, thank you for coming on the podcast today. Can you explain wellness coaching for those who have heard the term, but maybe never explored it themselves? Hey, Tyler, thanks for having me here. It's really great to be able to talk about anything related to wellness. I always get really excited about this. And to answer your question, um, well, wellness right now is still in its um, kind of defining stages. Um, for most people who don't know what a wellness coach does, there is actually a very um, detailed descriptor of what wellness coaching is to distinguish it from other forms of coaching like executive coaching or life coaching or health coaching. Wellness coaching, by definition, is when a trained coach works one-on-one -on -one with an individual to help them make changes to their behavior. And it is strictly defined as such. So a lot of times people will read about wellness and wellness coaching and not know that that's really kind of the backbone of it. And yet there are also a lot of people who are calling themselves wellness coaches because they work in health, fitness, or wellness, but they may not have a full understanding of what that description is. And also uh, the the shift or the, the change that I'm talking about with how it's kind of um, being seen in a different light comes from the fact that we used to look at wellness coaching and coaching one-on-one -on -one in a different way based on how it evolved, which was that it mostly grew out of corporate settings where you had executive coaching and it was more related to a professional coach coming in to help a professional become better at their job. And so that coaching or that coach being submerged into a corporate or business environment kind of gave birth to the whole corporate wellness movement because there was benefit to that. But that gets into a different type of coaching where you're working as you're integrated into a group uh, in a mixed model of one-on-one -on -one coaching and group sort of delivery. So it's at that point when people started having exposure to wellness coaches. And so the exposure was very um, much influenced or heavily weighted by the fact that it was work-based. So it's kind of had to grow out of that and learn to find its place, not only in how it's delivered in workplace settings and one-on-one, -on -one, but also how it fits into the overall healthcare model that we have kind of struggled with at times and getting acceptance with people like doctors, nurses, chiropractic, and other different forms of care and interaction. The, a lot of what you said there, it starts to make sense, but then connect the pieces in terms of how it integrates into fitness, health, and I'll say wellness, because uh, when you think about corporations and their types of physical activity they want for their employees, often you might hear the term wellness you know, or the wellness center, or even potentially somebody on staff that is a wellness coach or somebody that is trying to improve their health and wellness in order to improve productivity within the company. So that it starts to make sense when how you defined it right there. Yeah, well, the, the corporate wellness model is unique because like I said, it does incorporate one-on-one -on -one interactions where it's applicable, but there's also a requirement to be um, working in groups. And in fact, when a wellness coach who is certified finds themselves working at a company, um, they are expected to make changes for the entire population, which can sometimes include fitness. Mm -hmm. For instance, I've served as a wellness coach where a company with greater resources was able to build and provide a fitness center for their employees. Whereas I've worked with smaller companies where they were on their own and they didn't have that. So fitness becomes one part yeah. of it. But then when you work in a larger environment or a group of people, you have a whole collection of, let's say, risky behaviors or mm -hmm. 
just different actions that people want to work on or change. And so it can really pull in from different areas, but just really one of them is fitness. But because fitness works so well as part of wellness, it was a natural fit for people who work in fitness to look at themselves as providing wellness. And while that that's not technically incorrect, it's not the full picture. And over the past two decades, especially, the two fields have really learned to work together and complement complement or complete each other in a really efficient way when, and it's a great example of just being willing to learn from another profession or another method mm -hmm. or a different perspective and applying that. And so um, hopefully we can talk about the ways that trainers and coaches uh, can learn from different aspects of wellness and how coaching services delivered because there are definite crossovers and def definite um, advantages for each side to definitely pull and you know thinking about an old client when I used to train people he was a, a senior executive of a pretty big company and he once told me how he likes to pull from ex-athletes just because of their mindset you know tem they tend to be maybe a little more competitive which corporations. I could see why they would want that within their company, but also the health benefit too. You know, most likely an ex-athlete has good habits in terms of exercising normally, keeping their body well maintained, which I think that we're on the same page that it will carry over into the work environment and hopefully produce better products, better services, and whatever their job might entail. Right. Well, one big factor in corporate wellness, and I know that that's not the only mm -hmm. focus of where we're going with this, but um, it can't be ignored is the fact that when a corporate wellness coach is working in a work environment or work site um, uh, setting, the number one thing that they want to do is really drive engagement of the program because many times it's administered through the human resource department as a benefit and a marketing uh, tool to lure mm. top talent in. They say, hey, we've got a certified wellness coach on site who goes to you and delivers you know, wellness. So there's that sort of engagement issue, but there's also underlying issues, which are that sometimes you might work with, in a bigger company, a company nurse or an occupational medicine nurse where you're trying to either reduce the amount of workers' compensation claims or get workers who have been injured back to work sooner with your help as a coach. So there are other motives behind the corporate model. And some of them, again, can include fitness, but sometimes it's more like things like ergonomics mm -hmm. in an office or dealing with stress or learning to, it's it's actually learning a whole different skill set because you not only deliver coaching, but you deliver reporting and you also have to be accountable for your program because it's being paid for many times by people who are not even at that site and they're just determining things and the success of the program based yeah. on numbers. So there's a little bit different focus, but fitness can oftentimes be a unifying theme between the two once again. So there's a whole lot to consider with corporate wellness, but either way, the coach that is submerged in a worksite environment still needs to have formalized wellness coach training to really be yeah, truly effective. I think uh, something to think about for just fitness professionals in general, corporations, and I might be wrong with this stat, but like oftentimes it might probably be, just be one individual that's the wellness coach for the organization or the company. And as a personal yeah. trainer, getting this information, this could yep. be another great selling point in order to get a new client, or even if you're mining for clients in a membership base, talking to them about their work environment and including this in your sales pitch, because it's something that oftentimes as a personal trainer, you're like, okay, you know, I want to get you fit. I want you to look better or whatever that sales pitch might be. But here is another aspect that's so important. If the the client does not have a job to pay for personal training, they're not going to be able to be with you. They're not going to be a client. So if they're working, they're working right. more efficient, efficiently, and you are providing another service on top of whatever their fitness goal might be, here is just another tool in your tool belt for a personal trainer. What kind of benefits do you foresee as 
uh, being a benefit for personal training or even a group exercise instructor from a wellness coaching certification? Well, a whole lot. Um, if you look at the fact that a client might come to a fitness center or a gym having already made a decision that they have to make a change. And so they've kind of reached a stage of readiness to change that we evaluate and assess as coaches um, to understand where they're at in the continuum of change. So they've already crossed over some barriers and obstacles and they're already there with us. However, where Group X and personal trainers can really benefit is understanding more of the motives and understanding how to keep the client in the program by motivating and understanding and delivering goals or delivering positive outcomes. So we might have a client who comes to us with, you know, a need to lose weight or get stronger or whatever their fitness goals are. But that doesn't mean that there aren't other parts of their life that need to be Mm -hmm. also changed in order for the one goal you're working on with them to happen. And a great example is nutrition. So if your client comes to you and they're doing everything that you say, but they're not getting the results they need, usually a trainer will be cued into the fact that, okay, well, there are probably some food intake issues that need to be resolved. And as a trainer who markets yourself on the success of your client getting a positive outcome, it's in your best interest to resolve any nutrition issues. So being able to understand how to, to help your client make changes with food intake is just one part of the equation. But what about another client who might come to you maybe sporadically or with poor attendance because they've got so much stress from their job or their family that they can't even show up mm. for their appointments with you? And that puts your your results and your your whole relationship with that client at risk as well it's because you know most trainers want to get their clients to their goal mm -hmm. in a very timely manner yet there can be so many things that get in the way and so my point being is that it's not always just the rep and yeah. sets that people do but also things in the periphery that really um have to be addressed before we can really reach a positive outcome goal. With Group X, it's a little bit different. It's, you know, like you're looking at a, a group of people and the whole um, motivations and the whole adherence factor, but it's a little less defined for group exercise instructors, but there are still elements of behavior change involved in terms of progression and knowing your place with how you instruct people is a huge part of coaching because there's a, a an educational side yeah. of coaching as well. So there are some transfer or there is some transfer and crossover, but it's a little less for group X. Oh, I can see, you know, one of the things that you just mentioned was the getting people to attend. You know, that's something small, but if the client or the participant in a group exercise class isn't coming, you know, there's often some underlying factor that needs to be uncovered for them to improve their health and wellness. So those right. those are things that we often overthink or we don't think they're that important, but um, you know, it goes back to owning a business or being a successful instructor. If you don't have somebody there, if they're not attending, you're not gonna be training them. You're not gonna be getting that experience. You're not gonna be growing your, your, your class or your client list. So these are things that really they are most likely a part of the wellness spectrum and we just don't know that. And I think that that was yeah. actually something that myself doing research for this podcast specifically, or I'll say my eyes were opened in terms of yeah. uh, you know, wellness and wow, you know, there was so much more crossover that I didn't really realize. And a good example of this was on some of the YouTube videos that I watched. A lot of it was in the assessment of the individual, that initial assessment where we're yeah. uncovering information about a client, their health history, their goals, or even you know their barriers to exercise. So what are those things that are stopping them from coming on a normal basis? And these are ways that we can tailor our training approach. And it's just so much more than, like you said, the sets and the reps. It's more than that. Yeah. Well, and also one thing I wanted to point out is, you know, I had mentioned that there's maybe a little less crossover and transfer for group X instructors. However, where there is crossover is more deeper in the details. For instance, I know from experience when I've had to teach a group X class to fill in uh, or devise a class, 
that, you know, you want people to participate and clubs look at that as another uh, marker or metric that they say, well, this is a successful program or not. Yeah. So you, again, want people to be engaged. However, how many people will be reluctant to go to a group exercise class because they have fear about, well, I'm going to be uncoordinated or I won't know the routine or I'm going to be laughed at. And so a good group exercise instructor will identify people who might need a little bit of a boost and a little bit of one-on-one -on -one interaction because it speaks to a couple of things. First, their self-efficacy. How effective does the client or member feel about being able to just drop into a group X class and pick it up like they've, you know, have no reluctance or embarrassment for being a beginner and being around everyone else who's taken the class for probably months and knows every step and every routine. And, and so it's, it's their confidence level and their self-efficacy. How confident are they that they can just arrive and overcome their shyness and their fear? Mm -hmm. So sometimes that has to be resolved. And if there's anyone in the room that's in charge of doing that, it's the group X instructor. So there are some direct skills that go a little bit deeper into the specific interaction tools that a coach would use that do transfer over to a group X instructor, but they are decidedly different than what a trainer would face. Because again, you've got a client coming to yeah. you with a, with a decision already made. So they're just different dynamics and different ways to apply it, but they, there are, is still some, some crossover. Yeah. When you were talking about the self-efficacy of a client or even a group participant, you started to trigger, I'll say, terms in my head that I had never really gone through as a personal trainer. Um, I saw them in manuals. I saw them in courses. But really, these change models that are more part of exercise psychology, these are things that trainers yeah. often don't realize they are utilizing. Can you can you go over some change models and you know kind of where a trainer might have heard them before and what are probably sure. more commonly used? Sure. Well, there's a couple of ways that we have to look at change. One is from the client perspective and one is from the different models that might operate in the background of the uh, the trainer. Um, and so when people want to make a change, there are three main drivers of change. And the first one is uh, change by crisis. And this is when something happens. They maybe had uh, a bad medical report and a doctor saying, you need to make a change. Um, then we have change by osmosis, which is a little bit um, harder to describe. And so I'll use an example. Let's say that you're in a group of friends where everyone's been working out but you, and you don't like to work out. You have never seen the value in it, but you're watching your friends all get better, stronger, feel happier, and just generally in a more positive direction. You might start to feel that, hey, maybe this is something I should do too. So you might start thinking about you know, joining a gym or making a change. Or another example would be a smoker who, you know, if you look at smoking in our society, we have pretty much told people who smoke, you're not welcome here. If you're going to do that, you need to go over there. And then so people who smoke get that message that, you know what, if I continue to do this, I'm making a choice that I want to make myself separate from other people. And that might start to dig away at them slowly and they start to think maybe I should make a change. And so those are examples of change by osmosis, right? So we've got change by crisis, change by osmosis. And then the third one is change by vision. And this is where a coach or trainer really works with a client to sometimes physically close their eyes and envision something. But many times it's just what the client sees for themselves as possible for them down the road. So they're looking ahead and they're saying, okay, if I could lose this weight or if I could eat differently or if I could get my stress under control, how would that look for me or how would that be? So it's a vision that they project somewhere in the future. And sometimes, especially in fitness, we can use vision for a client to see what they would, you know, it's a, it's a more appearance-based call, of course, but that's why people generally go to the gym, um, to see themselves somewhere six months down the road. So there's that side of change coming from the client perspective. And then the other change models that 
coaches and trainers refer to or rely on actually go back a little bit in time. And the first one that really caught attention was the health belief model. And that comes from the 1950s. And this model was really based on the fact that they were trying to study why some people just don't get the message to get moving, get busy and get active. And you have to imagine that culture back then was, you know, there weren't gyms on every corner and people were still smoking and didn't know the dangers of it. But there were still um, questions about why some people chose to be healthy and some people didn't. And so they looked at this whole um, sort of situation with trying to understand why people don't change or act on it. And it was largely based on their perceptions. For instance, if a client or a person, I should say, had a known addiction, like if they drank too much, they might say, well, okay, I'm drinking too much. There's no point in me trying because I'm doing this already. I'm already, you know, not going to be eligible for making any positive change. So it was more based on the person's perceptions. And that's the health belief model. Then the next one to really make a big splash was the trans theoretical model, which we're still really using and defining today. And this was a product of the 80s and more psychologically influenced and breaks change down into stages. And the first stage is actually one where really most of us as trainers or coaches don't work with people and it's because they are pre-contemplative. In other words, They haven't decided to make a change. They don't see anything wrong with themselves. So you're not going to get someone who hasn't thought about making a change, either coming into the gym to hire a trainer or coming to your office as for a consult. So we don't really work too much with people who are pre-contemplative. And then some of the models for the trans theoretical model have five or six different steps. They've added a new step at the end of it called termination, which is when you actually feel like, okay, well, this client has reached their goal. There's no more. And that's a little bit more debatable because most coaches and trainers know that people will always have like an ongoing rolling sequence of change goals and outcomes that they want to reach. But the way that the trans theoretical model works so well is that because it puts people in different stages of change, it works really well, for example, a trainer who has the client who's coming to them to make a change with their physical activity, but maybe they haven't made a change with other things like their nutrition intake, or maybe they smoke or drink or don't sleep well enough. So a client can be in different stages of change for different behaviors. And this is, again, something that's assessed from the trainer or coach and only through good dialogue and a full understanding by having honest rapport with your client and then taking steps and actions that are based on the different stage of change. Because as a client is in a different stage, the coach and trainer actions are different. So for instance, in the action phase, um, it's uh, a little bit more likely that a client could relapse. And so the coach and trainer actions are a little bit different than when we're trying to get a client through the contemplation stage where they're they're thinking about it, but they're still unsure. So as you can see, there are different actions. Another model that's a little less popular and less known is the learning through change model, which really looks more at the details of change from the client perspective and what they're going through when they change. And also it looks at it as four main stages with a kind of a halfway stage in between. So there's a transition and then a phase. So the transition is obviously the change. The phase is kind of like, it's been described as, you know, looking at a year, a calendar year as having four seasons. And so we know that, you know, in the middle of winter, it's gonna be probably cold and snowy depending on where you live. But between winter and spring, there's that little period of time where it's a little bit of both. And so it looks at change as not so black and white, but having some gray areas where some clients are still sorting things out or they still might have questions or reluctance. And that's the learning through change model that considers where the client's at and their perspectives. And those are the main change models. Really good stuff right there. And I'm about to answer my own question here, but as a personal trainer, group exercise instructor, or any fitness professional, we tend to have this, uh, I'll say, 
mindset that everybody likes to exercise or why don't they want to exercise? Yeah. And it's so much uh, that goes into why somebody doesn't want exercise. And when we think about the epidemic in terms of um, a lack of people exercising in our country, it's so much more than, okay, I'm just going to get up, tie my shoes, uh, drive to the gym, and everything's going to change for me. I'm going to start losing weight or I'm going to be more active. It's just not that easy for people. And I think the ability for a trainer, any type of trainer, to empathize with a client is something that's undervalued. And it's another aspect of growing as a personal trainer or any type of trainer, that aspect of the connection with the client to help them reach their goals and understanding why they're going through these different stages. And that evolution for a trainer in terms of their growth uh, for themselves and then also for their client, that's just one element to being a personal trainer in their business. And like I said, I'm answering my own question in terms of the benefit uh, and the the business aspect right there. But it's so apparent in terms of why this type of education can be useful for uh, a a fitness professional. Well, I do want to um, explore that a little further here. And I want to say, um, and I have to refer back to my days as a corporate wellness coach, Um, to give this story or bit context. Um, When I first started working in corporate wellness, I was working for a major food service company here in California. And then I was transferred to a major soda supplier on the East Coast. And these were sites that had um, 1,500 employees each. And um, what I found was that I was the first person hired by my company to be deployed into these sites. So I worked for a company that would send coaches out and I was the only employee hired or the first one hired that was not an athletic trainer. I was the first personal trainer. And so we all kind of went about our business out there in the trenches and we would work with people, but we kept on having this influence of fitness creeping into it. And we kept on doing things like a monthly focus on, okay, well, we're going to talk about sleep this month in October when the clocks change, or we're going to talk about heart health um, when, you know, February is, you know, whatever the month theme was, we would go with that. But there was always this push to get people to be physically active. And well, you know, you do a lot better if you did some crunches or if you picked up some dumbbells, you could lose some weight, that kind of mindset. But then what happened was, and this was maybe um, pushing 20 years ago. um, And, and I wanted to say earlier that one area where wellness is growing rapidly again is in the corporate sector. But back then in the corporate sector, when it was still learning to find its place to complement each other, the coach in the work site was doing just more like, okay, well, do some crunches. I'll write you a workout and whatever. Again, speaking to your point that we tend to look at it as just fitness, but what happened was the need to elevate everything became more apparent. And one of the things that, you know, we wanted to talk about was just the state of wellness and where it's going. And right now, the state of wellness is that everything's been bumped up because we've learned more. We've got 20 to 30 years of solid data collection that have told us what works, what doesn't work. And we've got some professionals who have risen to the top and are pointing out what we're doing wrong and where we could make improvements and changes. And one of the things that my company did was they brought in a trainer who had solid wellness coach training. And she walked us through a 12-week program where we all sat back and thought, how on earth did we ever coach anyone without knowing this? So it was an example of evolution and change and knowledge where we became better coaches. And we weren't just out there saying, okay, go do some crunches, try to run on the treadmill, et cetera. But it became more like what you said, a key word, empathetic. And I remember in my really early days of training, my training as a trainer included learning to look at your client with empathy. And it speaks to something else that you said, which is that a lot of times trainers are doing things that they don't realize involve wellness coaching. Mm -hmm. So a trainer who has been using empathy for decades and having great results with it, and that's just one part of it. 
But that's someone who has been incorporating wellness techniques and coaching into their practice without knowing it. And empathy happens to, by the way, be a core principle of something called motivational interviewing, which is a huge skill that needs to be learned by really anyone working on a a one-on-one or interactive um, relationship with the client, because it allows for dialogue to be constructed in a way where clients learn to determine their own goals and they learn their own strengths And it's a way without passing judgment or telling a client what to do. So there's a lot of great reasons why empathy could be a podcast of its own, but it's just one example of a skill that's already been used. And another example of how the two fields complement each other. And it's another example of where wellness is going and where training is going together. And uh, I really am out of the, I'll say the training business in terms of I don't train uh, clients that often. And when I did, when I was doing this more part-time, full-time in terms of training clients, you know, you would sometimes run into that trainer that is more interested in the pain game of training a client and not really listening or visually watching their client yeah. and the pain that they're going through and yeah. being able to empathize their situation with their situation, but understand their limits mentally and physically, that's part of the growth of a personal trainer. And so as we get into the podcast takeaways now, um, and we've talked about this a couple of times already with the crossover in terms of the wellness and fitness realm, but also in the assessment and how we both mentioned already, how Oftentimes, a personal trainer might be doing things and not really realizing that's part of wellness education. And this is really seen, in my opinion, in the assessment. And oftentimes, it's because as an entry-level personal trainer starts working at a gym and starts knocking out one-hour assessments, they're sometimes given a script. They're given a, a template of what they're supposed to say or what they can say. And here is the proven model of here, here's what's going to give you give your clients. And so they go through these steps without knowing what they're doing. And I'm hoping right now with this, right. these podcast takeaways, we can kind of show them, no, you, you do know aspects of wellness education. And here is how you can expand upon them with your training and hopefully in the assessment as well. Can you c- kind of build on those? Sure. And I, I, I would start with um, you know, we got we have to look at this two ways. Um, and since it's quicker, um, I would start by what the wellness profession gets from fitness, which is the assessment protocol of biometrics. Now, biometrics overall are becoming less emphasized because people are becoming more aware of, you know, or, or more accessible to things like um, blood pressure uh, machines for the home or finger stick. Um, glucometers for their blood sugar, or they're taking more proactive control of their health. And those biometrics are a little less emphasized, um, whereas they used to be a huge part of wellness coaching. But we do get that assessment from fitness because fitness trainers do all of the biometric testing in a, a whole you know battery of tests or assessments. So there's that side of it. But from the trainer's perspective and what they get from wellness, it's the whole skills of coaching and the whole uh, realm of skill sets that they apply throughout the relationship and determining where their client is in the different stages of readiness. So one of the things that a trainer does to begin a relationship with the client or many times to even get a client to sign on with them requires that they build trust and rapport. And the dialogues that wellness coaches use with clients to motivate them or affirm them or even reflect or confirm things with them is something that trainers can use in their assessment protocol to get at that true understanding of the client. So in for, an example would be using reflection of meaning, uh, something huge in coaching, but really it, what it's about is when someone says, okay, well, I want to be happy. Well, then the coach would say, well, what does that mean for you to be happy? So if you were to flip flop that to a training environment, someone saying, okay, well, I want to be fit. Well, tell me more what that means. And just asking that question, you're getting more from the client as they open up 
you're building more rapport, you're getting to learn the client better, and you're learning more about where to take things in the conversation. And you learn also what they value and what's important to them. So just through the art of conversation and dialogue and refining those skills can be maybe the best takeaway or benefit to a a trainer who can pull in some wellness coaching skills into especially the beginning part of the relationship. Now, with things like motivation and adherence, those are also skills that are gleaned from or influenced by coaching dynamics. Like, is the coach or trainer likable? Does the trainer um, have a client who wants to show up and meet them? Does the trainer have a cooperative client? Does the trainer have a client who's doing things in between sessions that don't require micromanagement? So it's an understanding uh, the, again, the skills of a good questioning gets a, a more clear understanding for the trainer to know about the client, not just when they're in session, but throughout the rest of the week or in between sessions. So there's a whole lot about motivation and adherence that trainers can also learn as well. So being able to motivate people through change, being able to get clients to state their own goals, which is a huge part of wellness coaching. Wellness coaches don't really tell clients what to do. We let them come up with their own goals. And a trainer can take all their biometrics, uh, a client's biometrics and make things clear for like, okay, well, your body fat is at um, an obese level. Clearly, you don't need to tell someone usually that. But one thing that the trainer can take away from the wellness coach training a better wellness coach training model where we learn to not play the expert is that we don't simply recite facts to a client, especially things that they already know. There can be an educational aspect to it, but we don't tell clients, okay, well, you know, if you don't eat that, then you're going to be better off. The client probably already knows that. But the expert approach also is important for the trainer to know to avoid it because when we look at ourselves at the, as the expert, we tell the client, you're not as bright as me in this moment with this topic. And then that sets a, up a dynamic where the client then thinks, okay, my trainer is the smart one here. I've got to rely on them to make this work. Then everything kind of snowballs from there. Everything from like the trainer taking responsibility to uh, for the client's change efforts to the client wearing or the trainer wearing the client's problems on their shoulders, like, oh my gosh, I've got these clients and they need to change this and they need to change that, which is why trainers should learn from the wellness coaching model to not take on their client's problems and their goals and let them define for themselves through good questioning what those changes should be. That's really next level right there. I can't tell you how many different business approaches or sales approaches Talk about being the master of the of the conversation or the sales pitch and using that type of approach where you are the expert in the situation. And right, what you did right there was you talked about what that can lead to down the road. If that is the approach that you're going to have in your business, you might run into these situations down the line. And so by utilizing wellness coaching, wellness coaching education, not only can you build a better approach to these, but you're tailoring it to yourself and also working on building or sorry, taking down barriers for clients. These barriers that are just more than just entry level stuff, basic, you know, okay, I didn't go to the gym. Okay. What are my next steps? Or I, I know if I don't eat this piece of candy, I'm going to be better off. What are those next level concepts? So this is exactly where a personal trainer, fitness professional, group exercise instructor, strength coach, any type of professional can benefit from wellness education. Right. I would agree 100% with that. And, and also, one thing that is understood usually among fitness professionals is that our ultimate success can sometimes rely on word of mouth referrals from clients who say, hey, I've got a great trainer. Or what about the hundreds of people in the gym watching you get results with your client? The bottom line is your ability to get results with your client 
determines whether you've succeeded or not. And so these skills that you can draw from wellness coaching or the techniques of especially dialogue and and motivation and empathy and all of the things that we've talked about really support the goals and outcomes that clients want. And without them, you really come to a point down the road. And let's face it, everything with the trainer and coach is looking at something down the road. You face something later that might be unstable or not as solid as if you had built these things into your coaching model. So there are definite um, takeaways and benefits to, uh, I, I should just say there's more benefits to the trainer who can learn some of these skills for really supporting clients through behavior change because it's not easy. It doesn't include just being there in the gym and oftentimes includes many other things that can put their outcome goals at risk. Agreed. Agreed. And as we start to wrap this up, Mark, I think that how we started the podcast talking about what is wellness coaching and then going through the different types of theories, the change models, and then coming to the application of it. And this is where a personal trainer, entry-level personal trainer, or even existing fit- fitness professional will probably start to see, wow, I have been using those and maybe hopefully spark an interest, a further interest in this area because it not only improves their business, their ability to apply this information, but ultimately the client. And how you said the client being able to uh, utilize this in, or utilize these theories uh, themselves, but then also you know what it does for word of mouth. I think that that's a great uh, area to kind of finish up on the word of mouth of it. That if your clients are experiencing uh, better training, better mental uh, space. They're only going to want to tell their friends, family, other gym members about your, uh, your your approach to training. Right. I would agree. Another great episode for the KIPPS Personal Training Podcast. I want to thank our guest, Mark Tehan, for coming on, talking about wellness coaching, and we'll definitely have him on again. Thanks, Tyler.